Dear Heavenly Father, this day, and we praise you for putting people in our lives who have shown us love, allowing us to see your love through them. Give us, you give us blessing after blessing to show us your love, and we give you praise for the joys that you bring into our lives, like the birth of a newborn baby, an answer to a prayer that has been lifted up for so long, the safe return home of a loved one, or an appreciation on, or recognition shown to us that lifts our spirits, like Gary has experienced in his promotion to captain. Be with all of those who are struggling this day. Those struggles may be a physical illness or injury for which your healing hand is needed. The struggles may be dealing with the loss of a loved one or just a general feeling of loneliness and isolation with only your presence and your comfort can help ease. Wrap your loving arms around them and give them your comfort and peace. The struggles may be from the pain of being hurt by others or the guilt of our hurting someone else. Help us to forgive and to ask forgiveness as you have done for us. The struggles may be from depression, anxiety, or fear, or a sense of frustration over the course of our life or lack of vision for where we are supposed to be or what we're supposed to do. Help us to remember, Lord, that you have a plan for us. As the prophet Jeremiah has told us, plans to proper, prosper us, not to harm us, to give us hope and a future. We know that you are faithful and will never leave or forsake us. We specifically lift up those individuals whose names are before us on our prayer list. And we lift up all of the many unspoken requests that those in this sanctuary and those who are watching through the internet have on their hearts this morning. We trust that you will answer each prayer in a way that you deem best in each and every one of those situations. And we ask that you help us to accept even those answers that are not in line with what, they, what we think they should be. Oh Lord, we ask that you take the upside down world that we live in and transform it to your will. We ask that you rid this, this earth of this horrible virus and hasten the day when we all are able to meet together again, when we can gather in our houses of worship without mass and free to sing and worship freely, when we can extend a hand and give a hug to those who mean so very much to us without the concern of endangering them in any way. And finally, we are so grateful for the unfathomable love you have shown to us through the sending of your one and only son to be among us, to show us how to live and to lead us to the path of life eternal through his death and resurrection. And we ask all of these things in the precious name of that son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have a children's moment now. Guess we don't have anyone here. Ed, do you want to come on up and read scripture?
Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Thank you, Ed. Brothers and sisters, uh, before I begin the message for today, let us bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless our time here together. I ask that the power of the Holy Spirit flow through the word spoken and touch the hearts of those who you want them to reach, no matter where they are or when they view this message. May your will be done in each of our lives and may we be open and obedient to your calling. Amen. One of the results of this ongoing pandemic has been that families have been uh, forced to spend a lot more time together than maybe they ordinarily would. This has resulted in some strain and struggle in some families, but rec rec reconnection and renewal in others. Of course, the idea of family today extends far beyond just the mother and the father and the children they bring into this world together. We have blended families due to remarriages. We have extended families, aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins, etc. We have work families, people that we are side by side with, sometimes we spend more time with than our families at home. Church families, all of us. And then there are families that are created or expanded due to adoptions. And it's this last kind of family that I want to focus on here this morning. Many of you have experienced and have been blessed by an adoption, either personally or through a family member or a friend. I have a niece and a nephew who are adopted. I have different friends who adopted children from Korea, China, India, and the Philippines. When our children were growing up together and they had a chance to play, it looked like a mini United Nations out in the backyard. I know that my children and I were richly blessed by their coming into our lives. And while many adoptions are planned and are times of great joy and celebration, sadly in this day and age, various circumstances require family members to adopt a child of another family member under circumstances that are neither planned nor joyous. But having been an attorney for many years, I can tell you that the adoption area was one area of the law that truly was uplifting and joyous. It was a process uh, through which the identity of the person who was being adopted is defined and the trajectory of the rest of that person's life is changed. As we know, all human beings are born in the image of God and are loved by their creator. For those who are not fortunate enough to be born into an existing family unit, however that looks or however we define it, a search begins to find for that child a forever family and a forever home. Often as they grow up, the children themselves in orphanages or foster care systems yearn, yearn and pray for someone to come along and love them, not knowing when, if ever, that is going to happen. Elsewhere, and unbeknownst to these children, who because of infertility issues or just due to an abundance of love and resources, have decided that they want to start or add to their family. And they begin a search for such a child they take multiple steps to make that happen. The paperwork, the application process, the screenings, etc. They can take a long time and cost very much. But when these two paths collide, the child yearning for a forever home and the prospective parents searching for a child to love, they meet and form a bond. And it's a beautiful thing that changes not only the lives of the child and the adoptive parents, but all of those 
who are related to them or who love them. When a decision is made to make that relationship permanent, a consent to the adoption is needed from the birth parents, an adoption agency, or a government body. A legal adoption proceeding is then commenced and a ceremony is held. And at that time, the child is given a new name and a new identity. All connections with the child's past life are terminated and a new life as a member of a new family begins. From a legal standpoint, the child is deemed to be a child of the adopting parents, just as if they were born to them, which includes the right to fully inherit as full members of the family. From that point forward, the child grows up, belonging to these parents, being taught by them, and the children often emulating their new parents, including the parents' values, religious beliefs, even their preference in sports teams. Go Indians and go Buckeyes, but I digress. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't help it. <laughs> the process that, I, that I've just explained is also a description of the spiritual journey that we all have hopefully been on. All of us should be able to find ourselves somewhere in this process. Allow me to read to you four passages of scripture. In the Gospel of John, the first chapter, the 12th verse, as Ed read earlier, we find these words. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 15 and 17. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, which is actually an term of endearment, which is similar to what we might use as daddy today. Self testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. 1 John 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And finally, in the last passage that Ed read a moment ago, Galatians 3, 26, 29, you are all sons of God from, through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. For if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. At this point, I want to take a moment to clarify a phrase mentioned a couple of times in these passages of Scripture that I just read and that gets misused and misunderstand, misunderstood innocently enough by Christians and non-Christians alike. How many of you heard someone say, we are all God's children, or we are all children of God in referring to all of mankind? The statement is made to be loving and inclusive, but to use that phrase or title to refer to every person on this globe is neither biblically sound or accurate according to scripture. And it contradicts the verses that I just shared with you. It is absolutely correct, you see, that we have all been born in the image of God and we are created by him and are dearly loved by him and are provided a way to be with him for all eternity. But up to that point, without anything further, we cannot yet claim to be God's children. Bear with me while I explain. From the time we are brought into this world, we spend our lives looking for something that will satisfy the yearnings of our hearts for love, for acceptance, for a forever home and a forever parent. 
Some arrive at that answer quickly, while others take a long winding road to get there, and some flounder altogether or look to the wrong things to fill that void. Meanwhile, as this search is going on, and often before we even recognize it is going on, there is a father whose love and abundance are beyond measure, who is seeking us out and is continually wooing us to come to him. In church speak, that is called prevenient grace. Pre meaning coming before. So that very theological sounding phrase simply means God's love pursuing us before we even recognize that it is happening. And that father is willing to open his home to anyone who will come in. He wants us so desperately to be with him for all eternity. That he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to create a pathway to his door through Christ's death and resurrection. Let me ask you this. Is there anyone or anything that you love so much that you would be willing to sacrifice your child to save? If we are totally honest with ourselves... We'd have to say, of course not. I heard a pastor tell a gathering one time that he had a three-year-old son at home that he loved very much. And he also said that standing there before that group that day, he could honestly say that he loved each and every one of them. But then that pastor made a brutal but honest admission. The preacher said, but would I be willing to give up my beloved son for you? I'm afraid I just don't love you quite that much. Friends, do you realize and understand that our God willingly did what we and that pastor wouldn't do because he did love us that much? What a difference there would be in this world if everyone could come to fully understand that. And if sending his son wasn't enough, God also sent his Holy Spirit to work on us and in us to draw us close. We can experience it through the words of the Bible, the lyrics of a hymn, the actions or encouragement of others. A voice is saying, I love you. Come to me. And then there is that moment. When we finally come face to face with our dad in heaven who is offering more love than we could ever understand or experience anywhere else. And he tells us that he wants to be our forever father. To love us and care for us. To teach us and protect us. And he asks them. And he asks of you wherever you're listening. Would you be my son? Would you be my daughter? Just imagine the God of the universe is asking us to be his forever child. And at that point, it's all up to us. No birth parent, no adoption agency, no government body. It's up to us to give our consent to the adoption. And then with our yes, the adoption ceremony takes place. Our old life has passed away. The new life has begun. And we are given a new name. Now the rightful name of God's children. And the right to inherit the riches of heaven. So you see at the beginning when I addressed you as brothers and sisters. That was not just a figure of speech. If you've consented to the adoption and you are also a child of God. From a spiritual predict perspective calling you my brothers and sisters is true in every possible sense having been adopted by God into his family we are every bit as much siblings as any earthly sibling we may have and by extension we are siblings of our brother and savior Jesus Christ the gift of eternity in heaven with God our father and with our Redeemer Jesus is now freely bestowed on us, we've been eternally adopted. That happens the moment we give our consent. We, while we are alive on earth, this is not something we have to wait until we die to find out about. 
from the adoption forward for the rest of our earthly lives, we belong to our Father. We're taught by Him. It is our heart's desire to emulate Him. Is there anything better than that? To all who are hearing these words this morning, I ask you, where are you in the adoption process? Look within your heart and be totally honest with yourself. If you're still searching for something to fill the emptiness you are feeling and what you are looking, uh, what are you looking to fill it with? Are you looking to fill it with money, power, sex, alcohol? Drugs, other people who disappoint you, let you down and abandon you when you really need someone. How's that working out for you? And be honest with yourself because I've heard it said, and maybe you have too, that sitting in a church pew on Sunday morning no more makes you a Christian than sitting in a garage makes you a car. So just to say, I come to church every Sunday morning. That's great. But the bigger question is, have you consented to be adopted yet? And that's a different question. Instead, how about looking to the Father who truly loves you, who will provide for you, and who will not disappoint you, let you down, or abandon you ever his hand is out. The door is open. The gift is there to be given. He is asking you today, will you be my son? Will you be my daughter? It's so simple, yet so profound. It almost seems too easy, but all that is required is for you to say yes. You don't have to fix yourself up first. You don't have to get your act together or get your life in order. He just says, come. If you've never done this before, wherever you are at, I implore you, say yes this very morning. You will not regret that you did. Make this the first day of your new life as a true child of God. For those of you who have previously said yes, were adopted into the family already and are true ch children of God, you have a role to play too. It's as an adoption agent. Your father wants you to go out and add to his family. He has the love and resources. Go out and find those who are still searching. Come alongside of them. Show them that you care and help them to build a relationship with their forever dad. We need to remember that it is not our job, nor are we even capable of causing an adoption to take place. Rather, it is our privilege to guide those seekers, these future siblings, along the path that leads them to a relationship with a loving and forever parent. God's children also have a responsibility to each other. We're called to lift each other up and encourage each other as brothers and sisters bound together for eternity. As our time together draws to a close, I want to share with you the lyrics of a song from my favorite Christian, contemporary Christian singer and songwriter, Stephen Curtis Chapman that captures what I'm trying to convey to you this morning. Stephen and his wife, Mary Beth, Mary Beth actually is from Springfield, Ohio. He's from Paducah, Kentucky. But they're no strangers to that adoption process, having themselves adopted three children in addition to three of their own, and having set up a foundation that has assisted hundreds, if not thousands, of people to adopt a child. The song is titled, Who You Say We Are, from his Worship and Believe CD. If you go online, I'm sure you will find it, and I encourage you to do so. Listen to these words. 
Oh, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Oh, how great was the cost the Father was willing to pay so that we could be called children of God. Oh, how great is your amazing grace that took us as orphans and slaves and made us your heirs and gave us your name. There's nothing more than we can ever do. You finished it all on the cross, then rose from the grave and brought us with you. And all that we can say is thank you. Thank you. We are your sons. We are your daughters. Hallelujah. We are who you say we are. So lift up our hands and cry, Abba, Father. Hallelujah. We are who you say we are. Let us bow our heads and pray. Abba Father, our heavenly dad. We thank you for this time that we were able to share together this morning. We thank you for the love you have for us. A love we really don't deserve, which is your grace. We thank you that you loved us so much that you were willing to allow your one and only son to be brutalized and crucified on that cross of Calvary. To be a sacrifice for our sins, to pay the penalty that we do deserve, which is your mercy. We thank you for every soul who gave their consent to your adoption of them this day, and we rejoice that we have a new member of our eternal family. Father, allow your Holy Spirit to flow through us. Give us the courage, the eyes, the ears, the love in our hearts to reach out to those who are seeking a family to belong to and to point them in the direction of home. We give you all the glory and praise this day In the mighty name of your Son and our brother, Jesus Christ. Amen. My brothers and sisters, if you said yes for the first time today, I thank God for you and I ask that he richly bless you. I do ask that if this is the case, please speak to me. And for those on Facebook who go to another church, speak to your pastor. You can also reach out to me on Facebook as well. Or contact the church office. We'd love to talk to you and encourage you and to celebrate with you for this new beginning in your life. It truly is something that should be shouted from the rooftops. And I guarantee you, there was a roar of approval from the crowd in heaven the moment you made your decision. And for those of you who have already been a part of God's family, may our Father continue to richly bless you, mold you and use you in wondrous ways. You see, the house isn't full yet. There are many more rooms left. And there are people all around us that need a forever home. And I assure you that you will experience a joy unspeakable when you are privileged enough to be a part of an eternal adoption ceremony. Let's close our time together this morning with the hymn, My Hope is Built, which can be found on page 368, we'll sing the first and fourth verses. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. 
Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. And now, until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.